Hello there, it's Andy Parks from the Washington Times, and I'll be joined in just a few seconds by Stephen Dynan, Washington Times Assistant Managing Editor. But first, you know, as a listener to my podcast, you qualify to receive a 50% discount on an annual digital subscription to the Washington Times. Simply go to WashingtonTimes.com slash Andy. That's WashingtonTimes.com slash A-N-D-Y. And now, as promised, Stephen Dynan, Washington Times Assistant Managing Editor. Hello, Stephen. Hello, Andy. In costliest U.S. fight, little cash goes to actually fight COVID-19. So I guess the lawmakers are buying everything but the kitchen sink? Yes, everything but the kitchen sink, and apparently enough. They're also had not bought enough tests, enough vaccines. Oh, actually, we probably do have enough vaccines, but enough tests, enough uh, masks, as we've discovered as we uh, rushed amid the Omicron surge to uh, suddenly buy more masks and tests. So this is a story we uh, we took a look at coronavirus spending over the last two years, and it uh, it turns out if you take the amount of money that's been spent, six trillion dollars obligated by Congress, and compare that to the cost for World War II adjusted for inflation, we spent more uh, than we did to defeat the Nazis in Imperial Japan, which is sort of stunning to think that a global war effort uh, over four years did not cost as much as our current sort of, uh, you know, I wouldn't necessarily say losing, but not necessarily winning battle over the coronavirus. The key part to the story is that uh, of the amount we spent, and in Estimates differ because it depends on what you want to include in actual spending to fight the virus. But somewhere between, say, six and maybe 12, 15 percent of that six trillion has actually gone to pay hospitals to care for uh, coronavirus patients, pay for testing, pay for distribution, vaccine development and distribution. You know, we're talking about uh, 800 billion dollars out of the six trillion that we have allocated. Most of the money was spent on, on, on things like propping up businesses, unemployment benefits, things to to sort of blunt the economic impacts of the virus. And then a whole lot of the money was spent on just random wish list things that Congress had, like a pension bailout for private companies that have mismanaged their pensions. So it's really sort of sobering when you think about the the cost of the coronavirus effort compared to World War II and how well we're, we're doing or not doing. One other quick comparison that really sort of drives this home, globally, all the countries in, uh, on the globe have spent a total in U.S. dollars of about maybe 10 and $11 trillion on coronavirus, which means that the U.S. has spent basically half of the total global spending on coronavirus. Well, if you want to measure it a different way, it's uh, by gross domestic product. The U.S. has spent about a quarter of its GDP on coronavirus. South Korea has spent maybe 6% of its GDP on coronavirus. South Korea's death rate is 20 times better than the U.S. So just some, some, some sort of measures about how much we've blown and how little we've gotten back for that spending. Wow. Arizona Attorney General rules border surge is an invasion and the state can defend itself. And I also saw an update they can actually use force. Yeah, they, uh, this is Mark Barnovich, a Republican Attorney General, who really interesting opinion he issued uh, on a number of different levels. Uh, he says that the, so the Constitution contains a couple of different references to invasion and to sort of the, the government's obligations. One section uh, says that the federal government has a duty to guarantee states a Republican form of government and to protect them from invasion. Another section, actually, it's, it's interesting, uh, it's, it's sort of a bar. It says states cannot raise armies or build a navy and engage in war making except in instances of invasion. And this, you know, as you can imagine, this really hasn't ever been tested as a constitutional matter. But Brnovich uh, says that what's going on on the border right now, in particular with uh, with drug cartels and 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 the criminal gangs that are uh, that are creating or fomenting the chaos and the the people that are coming across the smuggling of drugs and people, that constitutes an invasion you know, under the constitutional definition. And therefore, Arizona, under that second section I talked about, has an independent power. And some might even say a duty, but an independent power to defend itself against an invasion. That means, you know, uh, technically that means it could raise an army or or a navy. In this case, what it, it sort of practically means is that the governor 
should he choose to invoke this section, could uh, deploy more National Guard troops, give them more power. Barnovich says it could, uh, he could start building border wall based on this, this declaration of an invasion. Ken Cuccinelli, a former Virginia Attorney General and former Deputy Homeland Security Secretary, says that you could actually deputize uh, people to engage in stopping, interdicting, and turning back illegal immigrants themselves. Barnovich says that he thinks this is more focused on the, the criminal gangs themselves, but uh, Ken Cuccinelli, who's been doing, he did a lot of the legal groundwork on this invasion question, says oh, you can do even more than that literally have your state police or even deputized people. You can deputize local law enforcement to act as border patrol agents for the state and detain, turn back people who come across without permission. Cuccinelli actually points out that this seems like a strange concept here in the 21st century, but going back just 100 years ago, the Texas Rangers patrolled Texas's border with Mexico. The, the Border Patrol wasn't created until 1924. Uh, so, you know, Texas Rangers actually would would, would do, and you know, state police uh, in other areas like Arizona, if you actually had smugglers coming across, it wasn't the Border Patrol that dealt with them. It was state police. And so Cuccinelli says this, ain't, this isn't really that much different than what happened for the first hundred some odd years of the uh, uh, of the country. All right, before I let you run today, what are you working on? Uh, so it's actually another one, a virus story. The, the, the cost story you're talking about is part of a, a lengthy uh, uh, three, three days worth of stories we're doing. And I uh, took a look at what the new normal is for uh, as we enter our third year of pandemic. And, and just sort of a lot of interesting findings about where we've been, what we've been through. But one of the real things that I, uh, two interesting things that people pointed out as I was trying to look at what the next couple of years look like, uh, one doctor uh, said, you know, in addition to the death, there are, uh, and we hear a lot about things like short COVID and long COVID, but in addition to that, there are probably millions of people who've uh, been, who've ended up with things like renal failure and, uh, and heart problems from having contracted COVID, uh, you know, actual scars from COVID. And that's going to be a problem we're dealing with for years. Uh, the medical world's going to be dealing with for years. Another la uh, lasting impact is just sort of the, um, the changes in interpersonal re in interactions and the debates as we sort of emerge from COVID about getting back to interpersonal interactions, really fascinating. And we're going to have to, you know, as a society, sort of work through things. Just sort of a personal note, I, I went first time in two years, went to a, a, a non-grocery store public building for a reporting event and uh, found myself shaking hands with sheriffs at the National Sheriff's Association and found that, you know, they're literally the first non-family people that I've probably shaken hands with in two years. And it was an interesting interaction. I found myself sort of pausing afterwards, thinking how easily I went back into that. Those are the sorts of things as we come out of the pandemic, we're going to have to think about, you know, do we go back to those traditions of greeting and interpersonal interaction or not? So a lot of interesting questions that get raised in this story. Hmm. You can read all of Stephen Dynan's stories at WashingtonTimes.com. As always, thank you, Stephen. My pleasure, Andy. Washington Times Assistant Managing Editor Stephen Dynan. Thanks for joining me today, and remember to receive a 50% discount on an annual digital subscription to the Washington Times. Go to WashingtonTimes.com slash Andy. You'll get 24-7 digital access to the Washington Times at 50% off. Again, go to WashingtonTimes.com slash A-N-D-Y. I'm Andy Parks. Have a great day.